Today I want to talk to you about starting your vegetable garden. I'm getting a lot of questions from first-time gardeners and while I'm excited uh, about more and more people uh, starting to garden and I love helping especially new people get going, there is a lot to consider in the process. So we're going to go through every step from soil preparation to choosing what vegetables to plant. I have over 50 years of gardening experience and the Farmer's Lamp is here to help you with information and give you confidence and support you along the way. So let's start gardening conversation together. How about it? First thing you need to do is decide where you're going to plant your vegetable garden. Uh, I get a lot of questions from urban uh, homesteaders or people who live in an urban setting who are wanting to start gardening. Uh, we also Farmer's Lamp, uh, an article for edible landscaping because a lot of places... Um, like where my son lives, they have an HOA and they're not allowed to grow certain things in their front yard. So, you know, you got to be aware of those things. And if you're in that situation, there are a lot of ways around that. So you can read that article on edible landscaping if you're in that situation. But even if you are, no matter where you are, no matter what kind of space you've got, you have to start with where you're going to put it. A lot of people in urban settings are doing raised bed gardens in their backyard. And I think that's excellent. I think that's a great idea. Um, they have trees or different things in there that that it can't make certain soil improvements right away. So a raised bed garden is a great way to get started. Now, first thing you have to do is you're going to observe the sun's path across your yard. Vegetables are sun-loving plants, and they need a minimum of six hours of sun a day, and some of them prefer eight to ten, so you want to be sure that you pick the sunniest spots. Now, some of them uh, like shade and can tolerate shade, so we're going to have to, we'll talk about that in a little bit, deciding what to plant. Um, it, do it over a week, maybe even two, depending on your weather. If it's real cloudy, it's going to take you longer to decide what really is the sunniest spot of your yard. But don't just look out there one time of day and say, oh, that's the best spot. Look at it over six to eight hours a day and see what area is getting the most sun. Now, the next thing you have to think about is how are you going to get water to your garden? If you don't live in an area where you get a lot of rain, and even here where we do get a lot of rain, uh, we have to water some in August late July, August, we do have to do some watering. So you got to consider how you're going to get that water there. Um, if you have to carry it by bucket, you know, you, you're going to want it to be closer to the water source. If you can run a water hose, then that's great. Our house is over 100 years old and there are no outside water faucets at all. <laughs> you know, so you, you have to consider all those things. And in some areas, uh, like here where we are, it's illegal and I know it's just impossible to imagine, but it's illegal to harvest rainwater. So that's not an option. So you've got to consider what you've got and what you've got access to. Now, after you've picked out the best spot that's where the sun is, then you're going to look at the soil uh, in that area. Okay. It needs to be rich and well-drained. You're going to avoid spots where water sits, where the soil gets soggy. That can rot your roots. Um, you, If you only have one spot, it's okay. There are lots of soil amendments you can do. You can use raised beds. And on the farmer's lamp, you'll find a section under gardening on soil health. And it goes through, there's all kinds of articles in there on how to check your pH, how to add the compost, how to use worms how to add calcium. There's just all kinds of information in there that you can improve that soil. Okay. So just because your soil is bad in that area right now, it may take three to five years for it to be a garden of Eden type setting, but you can do it. It can be done. Sure. Um, well, you may not, you may be in an area like me and you can't be, it <laughs> can't be sure. But if you have a flat piece of land, that's ideal. Okay. Uh, if, if you're South facing, that's ideal. If you are south facing with a slight slope, that's great. Okay. But um, you're going to want to not be so steep that you have runoff. Okay. Because you, then your soil will run off. But um, if you do have that, you don't have a choice, you only have a slanted, then do some terracing. 
or maybe put a couple of raised beds at the end of the garden just to stop it a little bit. Keep your friends close, but keep your garden closer. Now, I don't know about where you live, but where we live uh, right now, there are all kinds of deer. I've never seen the deer population so high. I think personally it's because there aren't as many people hunting wild game now as there used to be. So they're really multiplying and no one's thinning them out. Um, so they will eat almost everything that you put in your garden. We also have trouble with raccoons in the garden. They love tomatoes. They love the corn. They love the watermelons. Oh my goodness. And the rats love the watermelons and the bunnies will come in. So you're going to want to keep it close to, you know, as close to the house as you can. That's manageable for you. Uh, put up electric fence or some kind of fencing, you know, to help keep them out. So you got to consider what kind of garden, garden loving animals do you have in your area? Now I have a, a worked with a friend when I was a nurse excuse me um she was a first-time gardener and i've since of course retired but she was a first-time gardener so she went out in her backyard and she tilled her up a spot and she planted her a garden and it did horribly and so she asked me if i'd come over and look at it and i walked into the backyard and i, I saw right off what it was and i said you're planted by a row of pine trees and she said, well, yeah, but that's the best spot. And I, you know, and I helped her. We, we decided where it was a better spot. But those roots of those trees are going to sap the nutrients in the water. They're getting it first, okay? They're going to cast unwanted shade. And pine trees make the soil very acidic. Most garden vegetables don't want acidic um, soil. So, you know, you have to consider all these things. It's very simple to pick out the best spot remember your gardening is a personal journey what works splendidly for me might not work that well for you so just embrace the process let your garden be a uh, reflection of who you are and the things that you love to eat and just follow your own journey okay now you've got your spot picked out you know about the water next is the soil so you're going to prepare your soil planting soil for planting is like you know building a stage uh, for a play or um, setting a beautiful table for a dinner party your plants roots need a cozy environment they want to grow strong and healthy so first thing you have to do is consider your aeration compacted soil will hinder your roots from spreading out and it will keep water from penetrating S deep tilling can disturb all of the beneficial microbial life in the soil, but tilling can also loosen the soil. So it's best if you till to do it with minimal disturbance. You can use a garden fork to turn over the top layers without going more than two inches deep. That will introduce some air pockets into the soil without excessively disrupting the microbial uh, communities that are there the goal is to create a more hospital environment for your roots you want to get the soil as light and fluffy as you can uh, you may have to add loam to it you may have to add um, um, compost leaves whatever you've got to do and like i said there are a lot of articles on the farmer's lamp that will help you with that um, you put, want to put air in there. Another option is to practice deep mulch gardening. Now that's what we do. We do have um, our corn and our pea patch that we don't do deep mulch gardening in. We actually till that area. Uh, we do crop rotation in there with the three sisters, pumpkins, corn, and peas. So that patch stays pretty fertile. We do add uh, pig manure and cow manure and different things from the farm on wood chips onto that spot every year to keep it, you know, replenished and keep it nice and loose. But deep mulch gardening um, is a great method. It takes time to build. It's not a, unless you're very fortunate, you have great soil and have access to leaves and wood chips and different things that you want to put on there. Uh, if it's something you've got to build up to, then that's okay. Okay. You're going to want to build it up to three to six inches of mulch. Then you just pull the mulch back and you plant and boy, everybody and everybody's happy. 
part of preparing your soil is assessing your soil type. Um, where we, our family farm is very heavy with clay in certain areas and clay holds water like a sponge and that is not good. Your, your roots are going to hate that. So you're going to have to add some sand in there. Uh, and sandy soil itself isn't good because the water runs through. So it's got to be a balance. You want a happy medium. That's called loamy soil. The happy medium between say sandy and clay <laughs> is loamy soil. So if you're dealing with clay or sand, don't worry about it. Um, just add organic matter. Add that green manure in there. That's compost. That's aged manure. That's leaves. Um, you're going to um, add worms. Red wigglers are great in, in that clay soil. So uh, there are lots of things you can do. Uh, we have an article on the Farmer's Lamp called The Best Compost for Vegetable Gardens and How to Do It. So you can go read that. You've got your soil evaluated. You know what kind of soil you have. You know what kind of amendments you need to make. Next thing is to check the pH of your soil. It matters more than you think. Most vegetables prefer uh, a pH between 6 and 7. Uh, you can grab a soil testing kit from uh, your local nursery or the extension service. Or we've got, a, we've got an article in the farmer's lamp about how to check uh, your soil pH. And it, we have uh, pH monitor recommendations in there. So um, go check that out. And uh, don't forget about the nutrients. Nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, they are the big players in your vegetable garden. But they do need calcium, magnesium, and sulfur, uh, along with some other trace elements. So, you know, a lot of people have their soil tested. We have never had our soil tested. Um, just because of all the experience and knowledge that we have, we, we just haven't. It's not something we've ever done. I'm not against it. It's just not something we've ever done. I think if you're a first-time gardener, it's not a bad idea. We have some friends that just bought a 200-acre farm, and they did. They sent their, to their soil off for testing to find out what it lacked. It was uh, very low in magnesium in one section and very low in potassium in another. And so they planted cover crops and added some soil amendments. And so now their garden is just gorgeous. So it's doable. Okay. Finally, um, you're going to mulch. We've talked about the deep mulch gardening. That's the, after you've had your soil tested, you've done your pH, then you can mulch. Okay. Now, perseverance and patience are key in gardening. Some adjustments take time. There are some things you can do that, you, that are, you know, you see the results right away. And some take years even, uh, like the, the deep mulch gardening or some of the soil improvements. That, that takes a while. Uh, it's like baking a cake. You've got to let it all come together in just the right um, recipe <laughs> so that your soil is ready. You've picked out your garden spot. You've got your soil ready. And during all this time, you should be choosing what vegetables you want to plant. The first step in knowing what vegetables you want to plant in your vegetable garden, what do your family like? You know, I know, I know my sons, my grandsons, they're not really crazy about a lot of vegetables, but fortunately, uh, their mom and dad make them eat them. So they have some they like better than others. So those are the ones I try to plant. So you have to take a minute, think about what your family enjoys most, if, you're, if you grow it and it does great in your garden and nobody eats it, then it's a waste. So be realistic about how much you plant and what you plant. Uh, vegetables like tomatoes, beans, and peas, they provide a lot uh, in a relatively small space. If your family loves salads, then lettuce and spinach are things you're going to want to plant. You know, carrots, maybe radishes. Um, these all do okay uh, in partially shaded areas. So, you know, you, you can diversify what you're planting. Uh, early growers like peas, um, they, some, some varieties of peas, you can plant them. Then after they're done, then you can put summer squash there or cucumbers there or bell peppers there. Okay, then after they're done, then you can plant some root vegetables like beets um, or turnips in, in that spot. So there are things you can do 
you don't just have to plant one thing in that section and you don't plant anything there till next year. There are other things you can do. When you're deciding what plants you want to plant in your garden, you have to know your planting zone. We uh, have an article in the Farmer's Lamp about identifying your planting zone and reading seed packets so that you'll know what that information on that seed packet tells you. It'll tell you what zone it can be grown in. Um, some of them will even tell you uh, their heat factors and things like that. So it's understanding planting zones. It's on the farmer's lamp if you want more information about that. You have to know your expected first frost date and your expected last frost date. Now remember, those are just expected. Uh, we have frost here up until the first or second week of June. So we don't plant our garden until the second week of June. We just kind of keep track of the weather and take a look. And then we have our first frost end of September, our first freeze the middle of October. So, you know, you've got to know all these things when you're choosing your plants because you have to know how long your growing season is. And you have to plant plants that will grow in that amount of time. Okay. So, uh, you decided what you're going to plant. You know your growing zone. Now you got to get your plants or order your seeds. Now, we save seeds from our garden, from the things that we love every year. So we hardly ever buy seeds. Okay. Um, every year, I like to add a new variety of something. Last year, we added the Lich Tea Tomatoes. And I just I loved them. Okay. So we save those seeds. So this year we won't buy those, but we'll add something else. Now on the farmer's lamp, we have the seed shop. Uh, we uh, have affiliated with seeds now and they are organic heritage seeds only. So uh, we have, if you go to the web, go to the farmer's lamp and in the welcome menu, it says country store. You go there and you can find the seed shop and you can browse all the seeds uh, that we have there in that selection for you but if you prefer seedlings like for your tomatoes and your bell peppers you don't want to start them from seeds and i get that you know a lot of even experienced gardeners don't enjoy seed starting so they go to their local nursery be sure it's a nursery that you can um trust you can go to um buy heirloom go buy heirloom plants heirloom seedlings is what they're called um you buy those hybrids um, will not you don't want to save the seeds from them and it has to be an heirloom plant to save the seeds from and also on the farmer's lamp we have uh, an article on tomatoes from seeds to seedlings and bell peppers growing bell peppers and in those articles we tell you how to pick out if you're going to the nursery to buy your plants we tell you how to pick out uh, those plants how to pick out the healthiest ones the best ones so we have you covered on the farmer's lamp. Now, you know what you're going to plant. So now we have to plan the layout. Okay. It's crucial to consider the sun needs like we've already talked about of every uh, plant that you're going to plant. Sketch your layout. A garden journal, a garden journal, a garden journal. I've been gardening for over 50 years. I use a gardening journal. We have one on the farmer's lamp. Um, if you join uh, the Farmer's Lamp newsletter, you have access to all of our free downloads and the Garden Planner and Journal is in those free downloads. So you, you're welcome to go and sign up for the newsletter. There's spots all over the website for you to do that. Sketch your layout. This helps you keep up with your crop rotation. This helps you keep up with uh, what did well where. So it, it, it's a very valuable tool. So garden journal. <laughs> okay. So um, remember your, how your garden is oriented and how it catches the light significantly impacts the success of your crop. So mapping it out, you know, what gets where. Uh, as an example, uh, in the corn and pea patch, we have the corn on the east end this year and the peas on the west end and that's because that way um, the way the sun casts onto the peas and the corn they both need a lot of corn that way they're balanced everybody's getting enough of what they need um, 
down at the vegetable garden. We have two different patches down in the vegetable garden itself. Everything is in the sun. Next to the road, we have a huge oak tree that casts an evening shadow over the garden. And so in that area, I have um, the cantaloupes and the cucumbers, things that only need six hours or so that aren't going to hurt if they only get six hours of sun. So you, know, you got to consider those things when you're laying things out. You have to, when you're laying out, you have to consider your row spacing. Uh, orient your rows north to south, if at all possible, because that allows you more sunlight exposure. As the sun travels over the garden during the day, then you know, you're getting more sun exposure by planting your rows north to south. The space between rows, the plants that you choose will determine how far apart your rows need to be and how far apart the plants need to be in that row. So always check the specific spacing requirements on your seed packets or on your plant tags uh, and follow the guidelines there for how much space that plant needs. As you become more experienced, you can fudge a little here and there, but starting out, just follow those guidelines. That's good. Companion planting, huge. The concept of companion planting goes way beyond just putting plants together. Um, there is a symbiotic uh, relationship between certain plants and they benefit one another, not only just in pest repellents, but uh, in insect attraction and in even in flavor. Um, there's just a few instances that come to my mind right away. Many vegetables have um, companions that enhance their growth, improve their health, and even increase their yield. So, for example, if you grow basil next to tomatoes, I'm one of those that believes the flavor is better. Okay. But that also wards off some insects from the tomatoes. Uh, corn and peas, you heard me call uh, corn, peas, and pumpkins the three sisters. Um, the corn is a nitrogen drainer. The peas are a nitrogen fixer. So, you know, though, and then the pumpkins come in, and if you plant those three together in harmony, you have a very rich garden path there. So it's worth some time spending some time researching companion plants for specific vegetables that you want to grow. We do have an article on the farmer's lamp for uh, companion planting for tomatoes, so check that out. You're going to want to learn about succession and rotating. Now, succession planting and crop rotation, they do a lot to help your garden's productivity and the health of your garden. Succession planting is you grow a crop. Say I'm planting lettuce. I plant, I'm going to plant five rows of lettuce. I plant two rows of lettuce. I wait two weeks, I plant two more rows of lettuce. I wait two weeks and I plant another row of lettuce. They're all at different stages of maturity. That lengthens your growing season. Another way to use succession planting is you plant lettuce. The lettuce, it gets too warm for lettuce. The lettuce dies. You plant some beans or some cucumbers. Okay. They do their thing. It's getting cooler they die you plant some radishes or you plant some beets a root vegetable there in that same spot so that's another way of doing succession planting um now crop rotation is very crucial in maintaining your soil health it reduces disease risks um uh, insect like the potato beetle you know it, it, it by rotating when those things go into hibernation in the winter when they come back out in the spring expecting uh, you know, something to be there that they love, that they feed off of, it's not there. And so they die off. So it helps also prevent um, nutrient depletion uh, in your garden. So we have a, an article, surprise, <laughs> we have an article on the Farmer's Lamp that talks about the risks of poor crop rotation and how to practice good crop rotation. So you want to do that, okay? Then... We've talked about all of that. There are some special considerations. Vertical gardening. Now, if you live in a very limited space, plant up. Okay? Trellises, stakes, cages, they can support things like 
tomatoes and peas and cucumbers and um, um, bell peppers, beans, you know, that grow up. I love those um, garden arches, you know, that have everything, the squash and the different things that grow up it, and then they all hanging down under there. I've been wanting to put one in the garden. It's not very practical for me uh, because we have other systems already in place, but I would like to do that one day. Raised beds. They're not only great uh, in areas where you have challenges with your soil health, but they offer excellent drainage, easy to weed, easy to control pest, easy to uh, enrich the soil, and it fits in smaller places. Plus, um, if you have a bad back or it's hard for you to get up and down uh, off the ground, then raised bed gardens are excellent. I, we only have a few raised beds, but I really, really like them. And over the years, I, could, I think as I'm getting close to 60, I'm like, maybe I want to put that in a raised bed next year. So it's something worth um, worth looking at. We also have an affiliate program with Ole Gardens, and that's all they do is raise beds, and their products are amazing. So you can check that out in the Farmer's Lamp Country Store as well. We've talked about growing bell peppers, uh, growing tomatoes. You know, we have those articles on the Farmer's Lamp. Go over there and check them out. Um, you're going to want to read about the GMO seeds versus your hybrid, your heirloom, and your organic seeds. We have those articles on the Farmer's Lamp too. You cannot legally save seeds from GMO crops. Um, the company that had that uh, seed created owns it. And uh, like I said, hybrids are not reliable for their seeds. So you want to heirloom uh, seed. And like I said, organic if you, if you can. Now, that's a lot of information. <laughs> so the article is on the farmer's stamp. You can go over there and print that article out. Read through it at your own pace. Um, sustainable vegetable gardens requires a lot of thought but it becomes second nature i don't think about these things anymore because i've been doing it so long but that's okay that you are and start where you are if, if you can just start growing a tomato or a bell pepper in your backyard it doesn't take much to you know to feed a family um understand the sunlight and shade requirements of the plants you want to plant Draw your garden layout according to what what's going to help your plants grow the best. Remember, north to south orientation if prop, if possible. The proper spacing of your rows, the proper proper spacing of your plants. This is important because of air circulation and disease prevention, and also um, space for that plant to grow. Remember to think about companion planting. It's it's a great way to help your garden's health and productivity. Choose plants that um, are designed for, or not designed, but, you know, that will grow well in your area. Um, you want to grow plants that you're going to eat. And please keep a garden journal. It is so important. I cannot stress enough to keep a garden journal. You can keep your seed order receipts in there. What you liked. Make notes of what you liked, what you didn't like. You might not like a certain variety of a tomato and you want to change your tomato variety next year. All those things go into your garden journal. All of these practices come together. They play Each one plays a vital but different role uh, in creating a healthy vegetable garden. So implement these techniques. We are here. We get a lot of emails. Uh, you can comment in one of the posts. I'll see it either way, email or comment. And we will get back to you. We are here to help you on your gardening journey. So happy gardening until next time.